It's always a joy to be in CCF Alabang. I have lots of uh, friends that are not so young anymore. <laughs> and uh, just like wine, they get sweeter as the years go by. Turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, welcome. <laughs> you know, today, I'm going to continue our series on the book of Colossians, but before I do that, I want to really let you know from the bottom of my heart, I'm so glad that I'm here to speak to all of you. You may be asking, why not come here more often? Now, you, you may not realize this. CCF, we have around 70 satellites. If I were to speak to each satellite once a week, I won't even finish the round robin. And then we have international satellites all over the world, and they're all growing. So God has amazingly blessed CCF. We are a worldwide discipleship church planting movement. So let's give God the glory. <clears throat> now, some of you may not have seen my wife for some time now. Honey, why don't you stand up and greet them, okay? That's my lovely wife. <laughs> now, quick review. We are going to start a series on the book of Colossians. Last Sunday, Pastor Vince talked about Colossians. Do you remember? How many chapters are there in the book of Colossians? How many? Louder. Four. So here's the outline. Four chapters divided into two parts. Four chapters. The first part has to do with right believing. Say that with me. Right believing. Then, when you have right believing, what are you going to do? You will have right living. It's always believing first and then living. You have the same outline in Ephesians, the same outline in Colossians. If you look at the Bible, God always tells you what to believe first. Because you need strength, you need power. And then he tells you what to do. And the book of Colossians is so simple. The first part deals with who Christ is, what he did for us. Then the next part deals with, everybody read, what Christ does in through us. So you're going to learn this in the coming weeks. Today, our focus is on Colossians chapter 1. We will talk about the preeminence of Christ, verse 1, chapter 115 to 20, to 20, basically verse 19. Everybody, let's read this together again. Right believing will result in right living. Now, how many of you recently heard the news about this famous TV host show. Uh, the name is Matt Lore. Lore? How do you pronounce his name? Matt Lauer? How many of you have heard about what happened to him? He's one of the highest paid, if not the highest paid, TV anchor. But he was fired. He was kicked out. Why? How many of you have heard of Harvey Weinstein? Famous, powerful TV producer. They also got rid of him. How many of you have heard of this famous Democratic congressman? His first name is Al Frank. And then the other one is another famous Democrat politician. They've been in politics for 30 years. They have one thing in common. They sincerely believe what they are doing will not be made known. It's called sexual harassment, doing something not right with the opposite sex. And they all thought nobody will spill the beans. In fact, one of the congressmen said, I'm so ashamed. I'm so embarrassed. That's it. But he won't resign. It is really funny the people don't realize we are a product of our belief system. I sincerely believe if they knew what will happen to them, imagine your career after 30 years, at the pinnacle of your career, suddenly you will be disgraced, brought down. Will you do it? I don't think so. See, the truth is all of you believe in something. And we are all theologians in a sense. I always tell people, you are a theologian. The only question is, are you a good theologian or a bad 
theologian. But whatever you do, look at your own life. It's a product of your belief system. Think about it. All your actions. It's because you believe in something, consciously or unconsciously. Today, I want to share with you the important mindset of knowing who Jesus is. The title today is so simple. Christ is supreme. What must we do? <coughs> Worship Him. Turn to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, Christ is supreme. Worship Him. So when I see you next week, I bump into you, and I ask you, what was the message last Sunday? What will you tell me? Don't tell me it's a good message. No, no. You need to know and apply. So the application is, because of who Jesus is, what must we do? Worship Him. What does it mean to worship Him? Well, let me give you a definition of worship. Everybody, let's read this together. Worship. It is the proper response to who God is, what He has done, and continues to do in our lives. So, who Christ is. What he has done for you, what he has done for me, and what he continues to do. Our response is worship. Therefore, let's give an example of worship. Because of what Christ has done for you, because of what he has done for me, how should we respond to him? Anybody? When you say worship, all right? So give me an example of worship. Is uh, gratitude worship? Is thankfulness worship? Yes or no? Is singing to him worship? Is praising Him worship? Yes. Is obedience worship? Yes. So worship is a very important word. I believe many problems in the Christian community will be reduced or resolved if we live a life of worship. Because worship is centered on who Christ is. Do you realize the biggest attack on Christianity today is Jesus? The book of Colossians was written because people were saying it is not enough to believe in Jesus. It is not enough that Jesus died for us. You need something more. Therefore, Jesus is not supreme. You need something more. My friend, is Jesus enough? Yes. You will not know until you get to know him. See, there's a big difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Just like our president. If I were to ask you, do you know President Duterte? How many of you will say yes? See, many of you will probably say yes. You know about him. I know about him. I have met him. I have shook his hand. But I don't think I know him. Knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus are not the same. The evidence of knowing Jesus is how you worship I'm going to show that to you in a short while. For example, if you know Jesus, will you love him? Yes. If you know Jesus, will you obey him? Yes. All errors, heresies, idolatries, offenses, abuses, ungodliness in the church have originally risen because of wrong view of Jesus. That's why all false religions will attack who Jesus is. Today, I want to share with you from Colossians three aspects of who Jesus is. What's the theme today? Jesus is supreme, right? So, you must worship Him. So, there are three things I want to talk to you about the supremacy of Jesus. Jesus is supreme in our salvation. Jesus is supreme in creation. Jesus is supreme in the church. So, let's look at those Verses that describe the supremacy of Jesus and why we should worship him. Everybody, let's now begin. Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14. I believe this was discussed by Vince Burke a little, but let's read this together now. Everybody. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. A few important words I highlighted. The first one is rescued. The Bible tells us you and I have been rescued. If you don't understand your original position, what happened to you in the past, 
and what God did for us, you won't have a heart of gratitude. You know why? The next important word is the word redemption. Redemption is a word used freely in the time of Jesus, in the time of the Apostle Paul, during Roman times. Can I tell you how that word is used? In the time of Jesus, in the time of the Apostle Paul, the Roman Empire had more, they had more slaves than free men. It was a very powerful empire. Every time they conquer a nation, they make them slaves. So imagine that picture. You have more slaves than free men. Slaves are not always the poor. You can have doctors. You can have lawyers who are slaves. However, the only way to get out of slavery is the word redemption. You need to pay your way out. Because sometimes you are slaves because you were sold by your family. Sometimes you are slaves because you are a captive, you are a prisoner. So the only way you get out is you need to redeem. The closest illustration we have in the Philippines is when you go to a pawn shop. Remember, you pawn something, and how do you get it back? Redeem. The Bible uses that word, redemption. It is a business transaction. It is a legal transaction that says you have been set free. Because in the days of Jesus, when you are in debt, they put you in jail. There's a warrant of arrest. You will never know when they will come and confiscate everything and put you in jail. You cannot run away from debt. So redemption is a precious word. The next important word is the word forgiveness. Notice it says here. Everybody read one more time. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness is the real problem today. Psychologists throughout the Western world have been trying to help people overcome the problem of forgiveness. So what they try to do is very secular. They will not use the word sin. They will not use the word you need forgiveness. They will use the word you are a victim. It's not your fault. That's why you are feeling bad. You are a victim. So you don't assume responsibility. And if you don't assume responsibility, you don't need to ask for forgiveness. However, in the Bible, the Bible is crystal clear. You and I have a heart problem. And because of sin, you have no peace. And the only way you can have peace, based on the Bible, is for you to experience genuine forgiveness. And forgiveness comes when you admit, when you recognize what you have done, and you come to Jesus. Do you realize people today have a hard time forgiving themselves? I was trying to help somebody who tried to commit suicide seven times. And he tells me he feels guilty many times because he's a Christian. He, he, he believes he's a Christian. He knows the Lord. So I shared with him, you must learn to forgive yourself. God has forgiven you. Admit your mistake. Move on. Satan wants to paralyze us. He does not want you to experience real forgiveness. But in Jesus, He's supreme in our salvation. You know why? He died on the cross for your sins. So He accomplished redemption. And with that redemption, there is forgiveness. So you need to learn to receive forgiveness from Jesus. But above all, you need to learn to forgive yourself. You need to learn to forgive others. Can you turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I forgive you? And then your neighbor will say, why are you asking? Why are you telling me? What have I done wrong? Why are you forgiving me? <laughs> See? If you can say, in case. Anyway, my whole point is this. My, my whole point is this. Many Christians find it hard to forgive and the reason they find it hard to forgive, they have never understood forgiveness. You know, when I experience forgiveness from God, knowing my life, I have a heart of gratitude. I was so thankful that I have been forgiven. Jesus gave a story when he was in the house of a Pharisee. The Pharisee did not show courtesy to Jesus. And Jesus said, do you remember a woman who is full of sin? And Jesus said, because she's full of sin, she was forgiven. And then Jesus asked the Pharisee, who will love me more? The one who received much forgiveness or the one who received little forgiveness? 
And then the Pharisee said, of course, the one who received much forgiveness will love you more. What the Pharisee did not understand is this. He is a product of much forgiveness. You see, the reason why you and I have a hard time forgiving people, you have not realized how much God has unconditionally forgiven you and forgiven me. So for us believers, there's no reason not to forgive. Don't play that victim mentality. People have done me wrong. My father have done me wrong. Throughout your life, you'll be blaming others. So why do we worship Jesus? Because he's supreme in our salvation. Now, do you realize once you know what God has done for you, you will have a heart of gratitude. You will have a heart of joy. You will like to come and worship him. I ask people, you know, you know, Shishi of Alabang is amazing. You all come here on time, right? Praise God. <laughs> and none of you like to sit in the back. You just want to sit in front because you love to worship the Lord. Am I correct? Yes. I hope. <laughs> I was talking to somebody about the importance of knowing salvation. And I asked, you know, he's very religious. He grew up in this country. But he's not a follower of Jesus yet, in my mind. I, I know. And since we have this target of sharing the gospel with 33 people, do you remember that target? 33? Well, I was playing golf with this man, and on hole number three, I asked him, I said, brother, if you were to enter heaven's gate, and the angels were to ask you, why should we let you enter heaven? What will you tell the angel? He began to think. And he began to think. And I told him, I'm not going to tell you. You tell me why they should let you enter heaven. He was thinking. So I kept quiet. Now you have to imagine now the scenario. We are playing golf. And my son was with us. He's a successful businessman. On hole number nine. I only play nine holes. On, uh, you know, I, I'm busy. So I played in the afternoon at four o'clock. So by 5.30, we are almost done. He said, Uncle Peter. He, he calls me Uncle Peter. I don't know why. Okay? <laughs> he said, can you please tell me? I said, no, no, you tell me in your mind. Wrong answer, right answer. It doesn't matter. I want to know what's your per perspective. And then he said, well, because <clears throat> I do good works. I think I'm a good man. I said, yes. But he said, I also know I'm not that good. Oh. So he's answering his own question. So finally he said, no, no, you tell me. You see, when you evangelize, when you witness, you don't always tell them the answer immediately. You ask questions. You ask questions. And finally he surrendered. Then I said, the reason why you can never be sure of your answer is because you are always depending on yourself. You are always depending on your performance. Good works, you're going to church building, you're going, you're doing this. I said, but the answer is very simple. You must realize who Jesus is. He believes in Jesus. But I said, you believe in Jesus, but you don't depend on Jesus. You must realize Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins. He paid the penalty. Your focus must be on Jesus, not what you will do for him, but what he has done for you. And then what you do for him is a byproduct. Then he said, oh, uncle. Thank you. Then I gave him, remember our gospel truck? The best decision of your life? We have revised it. My friend, if I were to ask you today, how many of you are really sure you are going to go to heaven? How many of you are sure? You know why some of you may not be sure? In fact, just you raise your hand a little. How many of you are sure you are going to go to heaven? Raise your hand. No, no, not too high. Not too high. <laughs> you don't need to impress others, but uh, I have good news for you. Until you transfer your faith from yourself, from your performance, from all the rituals, from all your activities to Jesus, He redeemed us. He died on the cross. You will never be sure of your salvation. Once you are sure of your salvation, the impact is worship. You begin to worship Him. In my case, I've learned that worship is whatever you do in response to who God is. Good works is an act of worship. 
Singing is an act of worship because I do it for Jesus. Everything I do now is out of my gratitude for Jesus because he gave me salvation, forgiveness, and redemption. All right? So why do we worship Jesus? He is supreme in our salvation. But not only is he supreme in our salvation based on what he has done, but because of who he is. Do you know who is Jesus? Let me share with you who is Jesus. Supreme in everything. Let's read this together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. What in the world does that mean? He is the image of the invisible God. How can an invisible God have an image when he's invisible? The Bible tells us God is spirit. You cannot see him, but he's real. Image, therefore, is from the Greek word icon. It's a manifestation, complete revelation of who God is. Let me give you an example. In the book of Hebrews, let's read this together. Jesus and he is the radiance of his glory. Everybody read. The exact representation of his nature who upholds all things by the word of his power. Just in these few verses alone, the Bible tells us the glory of God is manifested in Jesus. The very nature of God is manifested in Jesus. What does it mean? For example, how do you know God is love? How do you know God is holy? You look at Jesus. How do you know God is all-powerful? You look at Jesus. He made the blind to see. He made the deaf to hear. He made the dumb to speak. The paralysis to walk. The dead to come back to life. Jesus has all power. He can stop the wind. He can calm the sea. He casts out demons. And above all, he died and rose again from the dead. Jesus tells us he is the one and only unique son of God. Jesus is God. Let me share with you what the Bible is talking about. Let's read this verse one more time. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Many people misinterpret this verse. Many false religions will now use this verse, the firstborn of all creation, to say Jesus was the first created. He's the first angel to be created, and he's a super being. That is not what this verse is talking about. The word firstborn does not always imply sequence. The word firstborn is a title. It is discussing the importance, the position, the importance of that person. Let me give you an example how that word is used in the Bible. In the book of Exodus, the Bible tells us, you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Israel is not a first nation. Israel is firstborn, meaning the most important. Do you understand the word firstborn now? It's a title, it's significance, it is important the highest value, the highest treasure. Firstborn, another example of how that is used. When it talks about the prophecy about Jesus, let's read this together, Psalm 89. I shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. This verse is not saying that David was the first king. He's not saying that Jesus will be the first king. But he's saying, of all the kings, this is the most important. Firstborn. Therefore, firstborn means what? Firstborn means highest importance. In terms of position, highest ranking. So Jesus, when the Bible talks about the highest, the firstborn of all creation, never believed this false religion that says Jesus was created. No. In fact, the Bible tells us the next verse. Let's read this together. Everybody. Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created. Now tell me, 
What is the meaning of the word all things in Tagalog? <laughs> Lahat. In Spanish? Todo. In Chinese? Long chong. In Mandarin? Champu. In Ilocano? What I'm trying to say, according to the Bible, for by Jesus, all things were created by Him. He was not created. He created what? Oh, do you understand that? All things were created by Jesus in the heavens and on earth. Now, to make it crystal clear, the Bible tells us visible and invisible. Super beings, angelic beings, spiritual beings. Visible, yes, those you can see, and those you cannot see. There are many things in the universe you don't see. But they're real. Next. Thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. In other words, Jesus created everything. Notice the next verse. All things have been created, everybody, through him and for him. That's where most people don't understand. While you may believe that God is the creator, Jesus is the creator, but you have not understood the meaning of created by Jesus and for Jesus. Why is that crucial? Because this has to do with the most fundamental issues of life. What's the purpose of life? You see, many people get depressed. They commit suicide. Because for them, there's no more hope. Life has no meaning. Idolatry. The tests of idolatry are as follows. Let me share with you. Three tests. There are many tests, but I want to give you three tests. To ask yourself, who are you really worshiping? Test number one. The test of devotion. Love. Who do you love most? You see, idolatry is anything that takes the place of God in your life. Anything that takes the place of God in your life, that's idolatry. We are to worship Jesus. The problem is this. Our heart has a tendency to worship the wrong thing. So what do I mean by the test of love? How many of you are singles? Can you just worry about me? Singles, worry about me. Higher, higher. I love singles. Okay? Higher. Just wave at me. Come on. Come on, singles. They know you're singles, so just wave at me. So. I tell singles, if you say, I will really only be happy when I get married, you're not ready to get married. Because whoever that person is, whatever that thing is, marriage or everything, in your mind, that has become your idol. Because you are equating happiness with that thing. If you're not able to be happy single, don't think by getting married you'll be happy. If you are miserable single and you get married, you'll be doubly miserable. <laughs> I'm serious. The test of love. What is it that if you lose it, your life loses meaning? You know, I have many people, their, their idol is ministry. If they don't have this position, if they don't have this ministry, they go to depression. You know what I tell them? You are not worshiping Jesus. You are worshiping ministry. You are worshiping family members. For some people, they worship the people's impression of them, their image. No, no. The test of your love. Next test. The test of your security. What are you depending on for your security. You know, many, many people, they say it's God. But in reality, it's their money. In reality, it's their job. Your security is dependent on things. Position, job. You know, I tell our pastors. I praise God for CCF. CCF takes good care of our pastors by the grace of God. Now, not all of us are paid. Many of us, they follow my example. Up to this day, we are self-supporting. No problem. But the fact is, our blessing is not because we depend on people or CCF. Our blessing is dependent on who? Do you realize your well-being, your security is on the Lord? See? Don't think 
It's people. Once you put your faith on people, they will disappoint you. The next test. How do you know you are not committing idolatry? I call it the test of obedience. Who are you serving? Jesus tells us in the book of Luke, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Let me repeat. Why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? See, my friends, you and I need to grow. Many people are not discipled properly. So they don't live a life of worship. A life of worship, if you realize Jesus is supreme, there's a life of joy. Understand? Gratitude. If you realize Jesus is our creator, he has all power, he can provide for all our needs, nothing is impossible. What will happen to your life? Peace, restedness. You worship him. Therefore, I want to share with you the importance of all things. Let's read the last part. All things have been made. Everybody read? All things have been made by. What they say? All things have been made through him and for him. Now I have discovered in my many years of ministry why is it that some Christians are not joyful? Why is it that some Christians are getting bored? Let me tell you why. While you have come to know Jesus, but you have forgotten the purpose of why Jesus saved your life. You have forgotten the most fundamental issues of life. What will I do? What's the purpose of my life? Why is that important? You will never be all that God designed you to be until you surrender to his purpose. Let me give you an example. Many years ago, my son enjoyed driving. I got a new car. It's a four by four. He was so excited. And every time there is flood in this country, in the Philippines, you know the meaning of the word flood. <laughs> you know what my son will do? He will bring out the four by four and he will go to the flooded area. <laughs> and I tell my son, this is a car. It is not designed to swim. <laughs> it is not designed to go through water. It is a car, a boat can go through water, but this is a car. You use it on the dry ground road. It may go through deep water, but it is not a boat. Why? Because the designer has a purpose. The designer of the car has certain limitations. It has certain parameters. Example, all of you, you have cell phone? Louder. Of course. You know what I did with my cell phone? Some time ago, I went swimming <laughs> with my cell phone. Guess what happened to my cell phone? It was not designed for underwater. By the way, this is Samsung. Okay? <laughs> it has one of the best camera features. By the way, this is a gift. Okay, Everything I have is a gift. Praise God. However, it has limitations. Why is that important? Many of us don't know who Jesus is. And that's why you don't appreciate the creator's manual, the designer. A designer will tell you how to best use the product. God invented sex. God gave us sex for pleasure. It has limitations. Young people don't know this. So they think free sex is wonderful. But you are not designed for that. Marriage is wonderful, but there are parameters. Family is a gift, but there are parameters. Until you live your life in accordance with the creator's manual, purpose, design, you will not be all that God wants you to be. And then you'll be amazed. How come I don't have any more joy in my Christian life? Let me tell you very simple. You were made by Christ for Christ. If you are not serving him, how in the world will you experience the fullness of life? So it's very important. When you worship Jesus, you align your will to his will. You live for him. See, God loves us. Our biggest problem 
is we don't know Jesus. And let me tell you the truth. If you really don't know Jesus very well, why will you worship him? Why, why will you be excited? You know, I observe people on Sunday when they sing. I realize many of you sing, but there are some of you, you know how you worship God? You know why you don't sing? Perhaps you are not excited about him. Perhaps you don't really know him. How can you not be excited about worship when you have personally experienced forgiveness, redemption, when you realize he's your creator, he loves you? My goodness, if you're invited to go to Malacanian, example, to see the president, let me tell you, how will you dress up? What time will you be in Malacanian? If your appointment is, example, 10 o'clock, what time will you be there? What time? All I'm trying to say is this. You watch your behavior because your behavior is a reflection of your belief system. So you and I need to grow. People ask me, why do I serve God with enthusiasm? Can I tell you why I serve God with enthusiasm? To me, it's a privilege. The greatest privilege in my life is to serve my Savior, my Creator, my Maker. It's a great privilege. Why do I worship Jesus? He deserves it. He's God. And the Bible tells us God is seeking and looking for true worshipers. Let's look at the Bible. Who is Jesus? Let's, let's read this together. In the beginning was the... Everybody. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Grammatically, intellectually, do you understand this verse? In the beginning, in the Greek language, before there was time. Think, in the beginning. Everything has a beginning except the Creator. Even scientists have humbly accepted there is a beginning. Matter is not eternal. They believe in the Big Bang theory today that something got everything started because they measure the radiation all over. It's the same, but it is slowly winding down. When something is winding down, that means there has to be a beginning. If the heat in the universe is slowly winding down, that means once upon a time, somebody put heat into it. It cannot be eternal. In the beginning, let's read, was the Word. The Word was with God. Huh. And the Word was God. My goodness. Read the next verse. All, everybody say, all things. One more time with expression. All things came into being through Him. Apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. What is the meaning of the word nothing in Tagalog? Wala. In Spanish. Mahala ka na sa buhay ninyo. In other words, nothing came apart from Jesus. Do you know what kind of power it is to create life? Think about it. The greatest scientist today with all the accumulated knowledge we have, cannot even create a living cell up to today. My friend, who is the Word? Let's read this together. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is the Word? At the Bible. Who is the Word? You see, let the Bible speak for itself. Jesus was not created. One of the biggest cults in the Philippines tells us Jesus is not God. There can only be one creator. Yes or no? And the Bible tells us, let's read this together, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. 
he has explained him. You know what this verse is telling me? No one has seen God except who? Jesus. And you will not know who God is apart from Jesus. Let me repeat. The Bible tells us you will not know God apart from Jesus. And you will not know Jesus apart from the will of God. So this is my best explanation about the triunity of God, why you should worship Jesus. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. We don't have three gods. One God, comprende? Manifested eternally in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. But we don't have three gods. One God. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. They are distinct. At the same time, they are one. For you to understand this, just humble yourself. You are finite. You cannot understand the infinite God. If you can understand the infinite God, you are God. I don't understand infinity. Let me share with you something that will blow your mind. Let's read this together about Jesus. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. My goodness, the Bible says Jesus is before all things. In him, all things hold together. What in the world does that mean? Do you know scientists to this day don't understand what holds the universe together? You know why they don't understand? How can you understand? God, in His infinite wisdom, made sure that the nuclear forces all over the universe is perfectly balanced. Do you know our atoms are perfectly balanced that they are together? It takes a lot of power and force to put those things together. You know why? Only Jesus can do that. Let's read this together. To the degree that your life is under the kingship of Christ, to that degree, your life will hold together. In other words, you must align your life under the lordship of our creator. He designed you. Do you believe God wants what's best for you? Be honest. Do you believe God wants what's best for you? Louder. Yes. Do you know He knows what's best for you? Yes. How do you know He knows what's best for you? Excuse me. He made us. Yes. He knows. And do you know that He really, really wants what's best for you? Well, then the best thing to do is what? To the degree your life is under the kingship of Christ, to the degree your life will hold together. Your family, your financial life, your private life, surrender that to Jesus. Everybody read. <coughs> and the degree you are not under His Lordship and not under His mastery and not under His obedience, to that degree, your life will fall apart. Why do you think many Christians, some of them start out well, they know Jesus, but something happened. They stop surrendering their lives to Jesus. They don't finish well. Their life falls apart. Very simple. You need Jesus. That's why I worship him. I thank him. One of the richest, or one of those rich men, is this guy, Kirk Stephenson. Kirk Stephenson was a multi-millionaire banker, financier, but you know, he has his own business. At the age of 47, he threw himself under a train. You know why? His world, his world fell apart because his security was in money. When there was financial crisis, by the way, these guys are so rich. 
Even they lose a lot of money, they can live on continuously. But because their lives are not under the Lordship of Jesus, it fell apart. No, I'm not going to say everybody will commit suicide. But I've seen so many people. They, they lose their joy. They're no longer vibrant. They just go through life. I've seen families fall apart. I've seen Christian families fall apart. And I'm sad. And there's only one major reason. You don't live a life of worship. To live a life of worship means you put Jesus first in everything. Private life, public life. You find joy in Jesus. And if you don't find joy in Jesus, that's not worship. Can you imagine, because of who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and you don't find joy in him, you don't look forward to serving him, what's going on? Ah, you need to grow. You need to know Jesus more and more. You know, the sun, you know, let me just give you some pictures of the solar system in the universe. How far are we from the sun? How far? Do you know? You've forgotten your physics? 93 million miles away. The surface temperature of the sun, 11,500 11, degree Fahrenheit. Now, don't worry about that. My whole point is this. If the sun is just less than 1%, less than 1% warmer, life will not survive. If the sun is just 1% cooler, we won't survive. What I'm trying to say is this. Jesus, when he made this world, he calibrated it in such a way that everything is precise. Example, the distance of the moon to the sun. Do you know if the distance is a bit closer, you may have tidal waves, just a bit further away, the ocean will die. Everything has to be what? Precise. Do you know the gravity of the planet Earth has to be so precise? If not, you won't have atmosphere. You won't have this atmosphere. Oxygen, helium, nitrogen will not be here. It will dissipate. But if the gravity is a bit too strong, it cannot work also. We will perish. Everything has to be precise. There are thousands of all of these things that has to be precise. Example. Oh, where is planet Earth? What's your address? Did you see your home address? Now, what's the biggest planet that's near the Earth? Which one? Jupiter. You know why it's near the Earth? At the precisely the same place there? Because without Jupiter, we will be hit by asteroids, by meteors, because it is like a vacuum cleaner. The gravity is so big, it will suck in all the falling debris in the universe. However, if you make the gravity of Jupiter stronger, we will be pulled out of our orbit. Nothing will survive. In other words, everything has to be precise. Let's look at our solar system under what galaxy? Do you know how large is our Milky Way? It is not so big. Only 100,000 light years. What is 100,000 light years? One light year is equivalent to 5.8 trillion miles traveling at the speed of light. If you travel at the speed of light, how fast is the speed of light? How fast is one second? Say that with me, 1,001. Ready, go. 1,001. Oh, you've traveled around the earth seven times. Okay. That's how fast the speed of light is. Now, listen to me. 100,000 light years across. How many stars are there in our galaxy, Milky Way? How many? Billions. Over 100, 200 billion stars. One of the biggest stars that's near the sun is called Pistol star. 
that pistol star can accommodate one million sun, our sun. That's how big our universe Milky Way. But that's nothing. Now, how many, how many stars in our galaxy? How many? What did I say? No, no, no not, don't say billion. Hundreds of billions. Now, how many galaxies are there in the universe? Do you know all of those white dots that you see? They're not stars. They're all galaxies. There are billions and billions, hundreds of billions of galaxies. And who made them? Is God amazing? Praise God, I tell you. Do you have a big problem? Do you have a big problem? It's nothing compared to Jesus. How big is Jesus? If he can create this universe, precise calibration, do you think he can solve your problem? You know why? Some of you are always sad. You go to Sisip Alabang like you're attending a funeral service. <laughs> You know why you don't have joy? Because you don't know the Lord. Do you know you owe it to the world to be the happiest people on earth? Because you have every reason to be happy. People who don't know Jesus, who don't have Jesus, honestly, there's no reason to be happy. I'll be depressed. Somebody asked the leaders of the United Nations, do you feel there is hope? You know, if they talk privately, there's no hope. The whole world, we're selfish. We want to kill ourselves. It can be depressing. But I'm so excited. You know why? Jesus is our Savior. He is our Creator, the Designer. And lastly, Jesus is the head of our church. Are you aware of that? All right, let's read this together. Jesus, He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will have first place in everything. Let me explain to you the meaning. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. What does it mean? Here are the implications. What is the church? The church is the body of Christ. In simple English, put this in your mind. People in the world today don't see Jesus. They only see Jesus through his body, the church, through us. If you love people, people will realize, wow, Jesus is love. That's the picture God wants you to know. He is the head and we are the body. Meaning, we are interdependent. Now, there are many Christians today who have no concept because of wrong belief equals what wrong behavior. You don't understand. We are made for each other. We need each other. Many Christians, especially from Alabang, <clears throat> I'm now talking to you. Well, from CCF. As a general rule, CCF Christians, by the grace of God, are very educated. We met service. We are probably one of the most educated congregations in the whole Philippines. College degrees, master degrees, educated. Financially blessed. Many of us are professionals. You have jobs. These kind of people who are successful in the marketplace have a tendency. I'm not saying all, but you and I have a natural tendency to not want to submit to authority. You have a natural tendency to do things your own way. You want to be independent. Because the truth is this. You feel you don't need anybody else. Because you're financially okay. Your career is okay. And that, my friend, is poison when it comes to the church. Because God made us as a body. You need each other. You know, the truth is this. I used to tolerate the differences. Because we are not the same. Now, as I grew older in the faith, I don't tolerate. I celebrate the differences. I praise God that you and I are different. Are you not happy we are different? Look at your wife. Tell your wife, I'm so glad we are different. (laughs) You know why? Because God made us different. Because you have different gifts. You have different burdens. 
but we are one body in Christ. And how do we glorify Christ the most? If we work together as a unit, let me repeat, the most dangerous Christians, the most dangerous Christian leaders are those without accountability. Because they have not understood that we are one body and Jesus is the head. And Jesus has appointed the church. There are leadership structure that we will become what? Accountable. One of the greatest blessings I've experienced in CCF is accountability. We have elders. I remember one time I wanted to invest in St. Francis Square because the owner was giving us an amazing price. And then the Twin Towers beside him, he said, I will build you a bridge. You can have this, the worship place, and the different floors for Sunday school, and I give you good terms. Yeah, to me, wow, no brainer, good price. But the elders, I can sense they don't like it. They say, why are we going to invest here? Are we going to be here forever? They simply ask a question, are we going to be here forever? Why, are, why do we need to invest here? I didn't want to push my weight. But that was the best decision. You know why? After that offer and when we turned it down, one year later, that company went into receivership. And because of that, look at us now. We were offered a better place. Do you know CCF headquarters? Where are we now? In Tendacitas C5. If we had invested in San Francisco Square, we won't have this place. You know why? God knew. The, all I'm saying is this. We are one body. I praise God. You know, I used, my wife used to ask me, Honey, do you really like me to be like you? Do you really like me to be like you? Because I always try to help my wife to become better. And she said, You really like me to be like you? And one day I said, I thought about it. Yeah, I said yes. And then I realized the world will be boring if my wife is going to be like me. Because we are really different. My wife is very creative. She's very spontaneous. And here I am. Man, my life is so regimented. You can predict where I will be at 6 o'clock, at 7 o'clock, at 8 o'clock. I have routines. I praise God. Honey, I'm so glad we are different. <laughs> and because of that, my character has changed. You see, we need each other. So be careful. When you don't want to be part of a community and you want to be alone. No. To worship Jesus as the head of the church means you, we work together for his glory, for his honor. It is nothing about you. It is never your ministry. It's never your reputation. It's all about Jesus. And we need each other. And the, and the Bible tells us it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. In other words, Jesus. 100% man. 100% who? God. And the Bible says the fullness of God is in Jesus. And if you and I, as a church, submit to Jesus, the very glory and presence of Christ is manifested in the church. And that's why I believe CCF Alabang will be a mighty force. Because I see unity, I see love in all of you. Satan's ploy is division. Satan's ploy is for us to divide the body so that Christ will not be honored. So I make it a rule in my life. Relationship, relationship, relationship is crucial. Humility, humility, humility. I praise God for the CCF leadership team. We value each other. We humble ourselves. We all work together. For whose purpose, everybody? Jesus. Is Jesus our Lord, Savior? Yes or no? Yes. Do you know this concept is so important? That Jesus has to be the center of our attraction, everything. Have you heard of Leonardo da Vinci? Leonardo da Vinci painted many famous paintings, but one of them is the Last Supper. Do you remember? Now, if you have time, you Google or you see that picture again. In the Last Supper, when he finished the painting, there was a cup in the hand of Jesus. And one of his artist friends told him, wow, the cup 
is so beautiful. When Leonardo da Vinci heard it, he repainted the painting. He repainted that portion. You know why? Anything that takes away the attention of the people from Jesus, I will remove. So he removed the cup. So today, if you look at the painting of the Last Supper, you see the two hands of Jesus. No cup. Because Leonardo da Vinci said, nothing should take away people's eyes and attention on Jesus. You know, I apply that spiritually. When people look at my life, my prayer is this. Nothing will take their eyes away from Jesus. I want my family, I want our ministry, I want our lives to point people to whom? To Jesus. That's the meaning of worship. He's worthy. He deserves your best. Somebody who knows worship is this famous lady by the name of Fanny Crosby. Have you heard of Fanny Crosby? Raise your hand. Higher. Excuse me. You don't know Fanny Crosby? Fanny Crosby is a very prolific hymn writer. She wrote 9,000 hymns. 9,000 hymns. One of those hymns you love to sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. You know that song? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. All right. What about that song? To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great things he... You know that song? That's written by Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby was blind. And her blindness was caused by human errors. When she was a little baby, a doctor misapplied the medicine. It's a quack doctor. They could have sued the doctor. There could, be a, there could have been a lot of bitterness. But you know Fanny Crosby? Learned what true worship is. She surrendered her life to Jesus. At the age of eight, imagine at the age of eight, she wrote a poem. Somebody who knows Jesus. Do you know that poem? Can I tell you that poem? Let's read together. Everybody. Oh, what a happy soul I am. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I am blind, I cannot and I won't. Somebody who knows Jesus. He memorized five chapters a week. And he has memorized the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He memorized lots of Psalms, Proverbs, Scriptures. Fanny Crosby loved the Lord. She served the Lord. And when she was invited to speak in a church, she overheard a pastor saying, How I wish God gave you the gift of eyesight. You know what she said? Immediately, when she heard that statement, she said, do you know if at birth I'd been able to make one prayer request, it would have been I was born blind. They were shocked. Because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of the face of my Savior. Here is somebody who knows the Lord and who loves the Lord. The older I get, the more I realize what a privileged life we live. I can never understand how Jesus, the Creator, the all-powerful God, would love me. How Jesus would die for me. Why did Jesus, why did he make me? For the rest of eternity, I will sing to him praises. I will worship him. That's why a life of worship is the only proper response for you and for me. Who knows Jesus? 
Jesus is supreme. What must we do? Worship Him. Let's bow our heads. Is there something in your life that is holding you back from worshiping Jesus? Remember the test. What is it in your life that is more important than Jesus? Notice, I'm asking you, what is it? Because I know for a fact, all of us have idols. The only question is, have you recognized the idols of your life? What is it that is more important to you, that you love more than you love Jesus? What is it that you put your security and your confidence in? What is it that you really serve? Well, whatever it is, I want you, I want you to surrender that to Jesus. And to me, sometimes the hardest thing to surrender is your own selfish self. You have not given your life completely to Jesus. You come to Jesus with so many conditions. You serve Jesus with so many conditions. But you have never surrendered your own. Why? Perhaps you don't know Him. You don't appreciate Him. If you want me to pray for you, I want you to surrender that privately to Jesus. Whatever it is, if you have something to surrender to Jesus, raise your hand. Praise God. I want to pray for you. You have something that's holding you back. And today you want to surrender that to Jesus. You want me to pray for you. Will you raise your hands? Higher. Praise God. Higher. Between you and the Lord. You offer that to Jesus. Anybody else? Remember, the Christian life is the process of demolishing idols. We all have idols. You just have to grow and surrender them as God reveals them to you. Today, God has revealed something to you. Perhaps, I don't know what it is. You want to surrender that? Raise your hands. Higher. Praise God. Many of you. Whatever it is. Is it your pride? Is it yourself? You have lost the joy of ministry. You know why? Because Jesus is not your all. Let me pray for you. You pray this prayer with me, with your hands raised up higher. Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, here I am. I humble myself before you. I surrender to you my idols. Lord, whatever it is, I surrender that to you. And to, today, I give you my all. I surrender to you my all. My dreams, my hopes, whatever is holding me back, Lord, I surrender that to you. If you are that person, you surrender something, why don't you quietly stand up? Yes, stand up. You pray that prayer, you raise your hand, stand up. And you are saying, Lord, here I am. I surrender to you. My own. And if God is speaking to you, and you are struggling in your chair, and God is speaking to you, it's not too late. Stand up. Because I want you to surrender your all to Jesus. Today will be something special. Anybody else? Stand up. Don't fight Jesus in your heart. You will never have peace. Because Jesus is our creator. He designed you. There is nothing that is so precious that you cannot give to him. Because he deserves your all. Anybody else? I believe today is going to be a day where your life will take a different direction as long as you are willing to surrender your own. Anybody else between you and Jesus, don't, don't worry about other people. Don't worry about your seatmate. If they stand up, you don't stand up because they are standing up. It's between you and Jesus. Everything is between you and Jesus. At the end of the day, you stand before Him. At the end of the day, He's the most important. The Bible tells us we shall all worship Jesus. In the book of Revelation, every knee will bow, every tongue will worship God and the Lamb of God. That's what the Bible says. Anybody else? Why don't you start worshiping Him today? Father God in heaven, I now pray for those who are standing up. 
who are surrendering, who are surrendering their all. Remind us, whatever we offer you, Lord, you are more than happy, more than glad to accept it and turn it around into real blessing. Help us to make our lives count for you. Help us to live a life of worship whereby we will be a blessing, not just to ourselves, but to our family and to our community. Lord, here we are. Accept us as we are. We surrender all. Take over completely. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you.